Well, if anything gets you into the Pesach mood, I'd say that was it. Good evening, friends. Good afternoon. Good night. Whatever time zone you are in, I'm Amichai. I'm back in New York, so Eastern time. And I'm excited to be with you this evening for our third Seder prep, our series of four new questions for this complicated year where we are asking new questions for the old Seder to make sense of so many ways in which we are different and the world is different. And we want to lift up liberation for our people, for all people, and make this night of Passover or two or more not just an opportunity to come together as we have in the past, but as a real opportunity for healing and for bringing people together to ask tough questions and hold each other up and um, make liberation a focus point on this and all nights. So for those of you who are with us for the first night or the second, the last few weeks, for those of you joining us here in the Zoom room or whether you're watching this later, um, this is the third of four. This is Dayenu. How do we interrupt the cycles of trauma that we've inherited? How do we lean into this Passover? We're thinking about what we want to perpetuate on Passover and what we want to pause and question. We've looked at how we're different this year. We looked at what narratives of narrowness we are or not going to bring to the table. And tonight there are incredible guests with us. And I'm really, really delighted and honored to be with. And we are all going to be asking the question together of Dayenu. When is enough enough? And what can we let go of? So as we begin tonight, wherever you are, please join me in taking a deep breath. <clears throat> However and wherever you are today, there's a lot going on in our personal lives and in the world. <clears throat> and uh, Passover is almost here. So Shira, I'm glad that you are here with me, my co-pilot. Mm -hmm. I'm going to throw the first question of the night to you. Da Ienu. What is one part of the Pesach Seder or meal or symbol or something that if you could let go of, you would or could or should? <laughs> Like as in, as in, just like enough is enough. Isn't like not happening this year, or maybe never again. Um, there is a part of the of the seder uh, symbols that I just don't get, haven't ever gotten really, and I'm really grossed out by, and really am ready to let it go. And that is the shank bone. Hmm. I don't like the shank bone being there. I don't like it. My family are purists, so there has to be an actual shank bone. My family is also vegetarian, so like it's uncomfortable. And my dad, who's, you know, he can't help but he's, you know, he's like, you don't forget, he has to show that it, you know, was once a live animal. And <laughs> I, I feel that it's awful to hold the bone of, uh, you know, it's beautiful to hold a bone in a way, but it is also, I actually never thought of it that way. Now I'm rethinking it as my imagination comes in and says, we're holding an ancient bone here, but it, it's too close. It feels violent to me to, um, to use that bone as like in that way. And, um, I don't, I also, you know, I work with children and I sometimes hear them. They say, well, the shank bone. And, it, and it, it even upsets me to hear it out of their mouths. Like it doesn't seem like something that is necessary mm. and is not helpful to this story anymore. Fair enough. <clears throat> I'm not sure when the last time I had an actual shank bone. I think we've substituted a chicken bone or something, but, or an ant, whatever. So I hear right. you. Well, for sure, Diane, on some of that weird stuff. Um, I will say that for many years now, I have not done Shfo Hamatcha. I mean, hey, for the record, those of you know, I don't do the Haggadah cover to cover. Many years ago, I realized that it's a really dumb idea. It is an anthology. Forgive me, Maxwell House and Jewish tradition. It was never meant to be read cover to effing cover. It is an anthology. I've used it before. It's like you're using every single recipe in the poultry section of your New John Nathan cookbook for yeah. one dinner. It's just like, it's obscene. 
So for sure, I don't use 90% or 80% of the Haggadah. But the thing I've taken con consciously out is the part at the end when we invite Elijah and open the door. And part of the text is throw your wrath upon the other nations. And there's so much there with the us and them that for years I'm like, I don't want to do this. Yeah. But here uh, for sure. I want to okay. examine a lot of where we are porous and where we honor boundaries and order borders and honor mm -hmm. closed doors and open doors, mm -hmm. liberation. But there's the us, them part that I'm really thinking. And I've never really done the 10 drops of wine. That's always, it's kind of pretty in a man mandala-esque way, but <laughs> no, 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 no. You, you know, it just makes me realize that like in the Haggadah, um, there is, you have to read, but you have to, like, it's, there's a lot of small print. There's a lot of small print. Like, I never saw that line. The the opening of the door was always so thing, but I never saw that line. And now I'll have to go look for it. But, you know. No, 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 it's fine. It's, it's, it's Diana. We cut it out. It's Diana, Diana. Okay, well, I just, I do want to bring this to the studio audience and see, um, you know, Amanda is here with us, our very incredible Zoom tech, holding down all the corners of this virtual temple. And uh, Amanda just put into this, what's one part of the Seder that, that you would like to let go of, consider consider a Dainu this moment. Um, and while those ideas are coming in and we're just starting to seed into this, I would like to take this opportunity, everyone, my, my family of Lab Shul and friends and all of you online, uh, to introduce to you two very special sacred artists that are gonna be here with us to go into frankly territory that we've never been. Not because we haven't tried, but because I think they're going to, um, their assignment, this this uh, bringing them in today is to help us go to a place um, that maybe we've never been before. And that's a very special kind of radical dreaming. Passover, thank you. That's one thing we'll keep for from Passover. Um, so many of you... I wanted to say have grown up with Rebecca, um, but Rebecca has been a, a special artist who's been working with us for a number of years. And she's a vocal artist, Rebecca Goldsmith. She is a deep, she works with deep group connection. This is my, one of my most important notes about working with Rebecca. She comes from the world of improvisation, which means that she's an extraordinary listener and holder of space. So we are so grateful to have you here. And Rebecca is going to is going to help us be in these bodies that we are in and um, ground together as a preparation for working with Joe Kent Katz. Um, and Joe is here. Joe is an intuitive healer uh, and a political educator. So put those two things together. I met Joe a couple some things ago um, in a, another online experience where I learned so much about my own existence in the short amount of time that I had with Joe, that I have become a dedicated follower um, of her work. And so it's really very special that we get to have um, you here with us. So thank you so much, Joe. And I'm going to hand our space over to you, but I will take a, a minute. Um, I think their bios are now in the chat. And I do see a number of fun, fun little bits in here for your reading entertainment about what you might like to be Dianu with. <laughs> so I'll um, invite you. Sure. And maybe just yeah. before we go, um, we'd yeah. like to just have Amanda show us the four questions, the one pager to ground our to ground our studio audience in the okay. questions we looked at and tonight's. And then we'll go dive into the Diana world. Great. Thank okay. you, Amanda. So here you are, folks. Some of you again been with us before and some just joining. We looked at Manishta now, how are we different this year? We looked at Avadim Hainu, what narratives of enslavement and narrowness are we highlighting this year as we transform from hurting to healing? And tonight, Dayenu, enough. How do we say enough already to stop the tragic cycle of oppression and beyond? And we're going to go back and look at the actual guide later this evening. So you have everything you need to use this, print this, um, adapt it in any way that works for you. And with that, let's get into it. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Let's bring in Rebecca. Oh, 
What a privilege to be here tonight uh, and to receive such a beautiful honoring and uh, welcoming. Thank you, Shira. Thank you, Amichai. Uh, and to be here with Joe and all of you, I'm sad I can't be here for the whole experience, but I'm, I'm pleased to be able to bring us in and orient, orient us into this moment so that the beautiful work that you'll do uh, over the course of the next hour and a half um, is more possible and more available. So I'm going to orient us in body and breath, in space and in voice. And what we're really doing is practicing widening and different ways of slowing ourselves. So we're going to start with our breath. And I just actually want you to notice your breath as it is right now. Don't do anything different, but just notice, notice your breath. You might notice what's happening in your body. You might notice the temperature of your breath. You might notice the speed of your breath. Whether you're breathing through your nose or your mouth or both. And now I'm going to ask you to slow your breath down by half the speed, both the inhale and the exhale. And continue to notice as you do. And now I'll ask you to slow the exhale down even more, as slow as you possibly can in a, in a gentle way with yourself. Notice what you're noticing as you do this. Take one last breath wherever you are on this very slower pace. And you can return to whatever new pace is here for you. And we'll start to turn our attention more to the body and to stretching. So however your body wants to stretch right now. Just give yourself a chance to move in the way that you need right now. Maybe you see someone in the screen who's doing something that you like. You might try that out too. Now I'm going to ask you to pause in whatever stretch you're in right now and just take this position in. And now 
See if you can find the stretch within the stretch. And now allow yourself to move. What stretch comes from the stretch within the stretch? And as you're ready, you can return to some space of neutrality for yourself. And take a moment to just notice your body now. And now what I'm going to invite you to do is orient to the room you're in. So just taking a look around at your space. Just as you might. Look around. And notice. And now go ahead and do that at half the pace. Slow it down for yourself. And allow yourself to pause. Keep looking around, but when it strikes you to pause, stop. Bring your last awareness to your screen and see if there's something on your screen that you want to spend a little time noticing. And the last thing we're going to orient to today is our voices and sound. So I'm going to sing a very gentle and simple chant, and I'll have you sing it with me. With the word Dayenu. Dayenu. Dayenu 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 Keep going, we're going to slow it down. Dayenu
דיינו. And because we're circular, just allowing yourself to return to your breath. Thanks, everyone. Here, Rebecca. Hmm. Just feeling the really sweet ripples of the singing and feeling like it's such a um, such a prayer. Um, like we're really calling calling in the enoughness, calling in the completion, like taking a bow of what we, um, what no longer serves us. In particular, these ancestral layers, these ancestral patterns of thinking and believing and feeling um, that we inherited for such a good reason, um, but that that are no longer in service. Um, so this is what I get to share about today. And I'm so grateful to be here with you all. I feel like very lucky, like sparkly lucky. Like I've just been handed a really, like a little lo love note and I get to be here with you all. So thank you for being my love note. Um, not Diana to that, more of that. Keep pouring that on. <laughs> Um, but I, I think it's in part because um, it feels like such a, a powerful time to be talking about um, what we're no longer willing to um, continue, what we're no longer willing to unconsciously allow for, unconsciously collude with, unconsciously perpetuate. And I'm speaking specifically about um, patterns of thinking and believing and feeling um, that we've inherited from ancestors where for our families, for our ancestors, those ways of being were precisely what was needed in a moment in history. Like a lot of those ways of thinking, believing, acting were somatically attuned, brilliant, spot on, precisely what needed to happen in that moment. And in those moments, when I say in that moment, I mean a moment of survival, a moment when our people were needing to make quick decisions, um, were needing to figure out ways to escape, figuring out ways to survive. And when those ways of being worked, when they worked and all of our families had things that worked because we're the evidence of that. We're here, right? We're alive here. So something that our people did worked. And when it did, that way of thinking or believing or acting um, gets kind of cataloged in the brain as a really good idea. That was a really good idea. We'll, we'll do it again. And so we do, our people do it again and we do it again and we pass it down as what I like to call ancestrally proven best practices. Um, and I say that phrase kind of tongue in cheek, um, but when something works and you use it again and it works again, then, it, then it's worth passing down. But then what happens is um, we practice these ways of being, ways of thinking, ways of feeling, ways of acting now in this context, and um, it doesn't have the same impact. 
in fact, some of the time when we do these ways, we, we like enact these ways that our ancestors did, and it actually has an averse impact. Um, it no longer is like acutely perfect for the moment. It actually becomes a hindrance, sometimes hurts us, sometimes hurts other people. And I want to give a really big example here. Um, my really big example is that um, I, for me, for my, for my mom and my aunt, for my grandmother, um, there's this very strong um, like feeling of being compelled to move really fast. Um, I can watch myself do it. Like I'm kind of running through the house when there's nobody chasing me. I don't even need to hurry. It just feels like there's a natural pace in me that wants to move very quickly. And I think about me and my sister and my mom in the kitchen when we were growing up and how we were sort of anticipating what she was needing so that we could be part of her kitchen choreography. Things were always moving very fast. And I think about my mom and my aunt when they were growing up and um, how there was so much anger, there was so much, there was so much kind of trauma in the family and how they were kind of maneuvering very quickly to manage that. And the thing is I can keep tracking it back. And, um, and when I do, then it starts getting really interesting um, because I start to find that the moving really fast is not just a response to trauma that's already there or trying to um, fix things in the family or trying to make things work, trying to appease. It actually tracks back to a time when that hurrying was necessary. It was precisely the right thing. It was needed. And um, with this pattern, I can track it back to my grandfather's mother, Esther Litovitz. May her memory be for a blessing. And she um, survived some early pogroms in Poland. And I know that there were um, probably many moments, but one in particular that I can feel the imprint of where um, her and her parents had to run um, to survive. And um, as they ran, anyone or anything that was even a little bit in their way was actually a threat to their lives. And when I think about that moment, the first thing I think about is how terrifying that is and how in my family, the moving fast comes from that kind of terror. But then I think about the fact that they also were carrying ancestral imprints previous to them. Because a lot of times when we think about these patterns, we go back one, two, three generations, but actually we could go back 16, 17 generations, 23 generations, 36 generations. We're all carrying the imprint of those traumas plus the imprint of um, like divine presence and faith and gifts, resilience. Okay, so I'm gonna bring it back to me. Um, so I could notice myself in the kitchen, like earlier this week, listening to my partner tell like a really beautiful story about work. And I'm listening to her, but I'm also doing a few other things, like kind of running errands in my head. Um, like I'm kind of scrolling through my email in my head, like, oh yeah, I didn't get back to that person. Shira needs that invoice from me. I need to get that invoice to her. Like I'm just, I'm I'm literally moving or moving still, even if I'm even if I'm still. Um I can tell also that like someone's trying to help me out. Let's say they're trying to offer me some support. And if it's not exactly what I think that I need, it feels like they're a nuisance. Like they're actually in my way rather than supporting me on my way. Um, there's just, there's all these ways that I am like demonstrating evidence of what my ancestors survived. Resma Menachem um, is a really powerful educator and writer, and he has a phrase, um, his phrase is to, uh, to recontextualize. 
meaning to place the pattern of thinking, of feeling, of believing back into context so that we understand the potency of it. We understand the power of it. We understand the significance of it. Because in this case, I could shame myself. I could blame myself. I could I could be angry for my whole lifetime at my mom. I mean, I've done that for like 40 something years. I'm, I'm actually kind of done with that. Um, for carrying these patterns, for acting this way, for being this way. Um, and what I'd be missing in those moments is the context, the context when this pattern made sense, this context when this pattern was of value. Now, the thing is that if, you know, if there were a reason why me and my family needed to run right now, and I'm aware of what the context that we're speaking of right now, you know, we're, we're witnessing the, the same kind of having to move quickly, having to pick up everyone at the same time and go in Gaza. Um, I know that we could do it because we've been practicing it for many generations. I know that I could move that fast. I know that I could move that fast. The thing that the body doesn't always remember that we get to be, um, that we get to pay attention to is that just because we've been doing something the whole time doesn't mean we have to keep doing it. Just because it worked one time doesn't need, mean we need to keep practicing it. I get to decide that that capacity to move fast is in me enough that if I need to call on it, it's there. And if I know that, then all of a sudden some spaciousness opens up. All of a sudden I have some choice. And this is where the Dayanu part comes in. I have some choice. I get to choose how I want to respond to this moment. I get to choose if moving fast, or in my case with my partner, if like just deciding to stop the, the running errands in my mind and just listen. Um, I have the freedom to do that. And I get to practice discerning when is it time to choose something else. I'm just going to breathe for a second and see what wants to come next. So um, a layer that I want to add is that um, Just to place us in this context, to, to recontextualize us here um, today in this time, um, in the, you know, in, in the ripples of the of, of Hamas's attack on October 7th, right in the weave of of what is unfolding, the devastation, the horror, the starvation that's unfolding in Gaza. Um something very powerful is happening to those of us who are witness to this moment, um, who are physically safe, but witness to this moment, which is that an incredible amount of these ancestral layers, these inherited layers are rising up, ready for healing. Um, it, when I feel into it, it feels like an, like a, a phenomenon, like an energetic phenomenon, these like layers of, of ways of thinking and behaving and believing um, that are kind of carried in our system, carried in our carried in our blood, carried in our fat cells that are actually like arising, coming to the surface, wanting to be known, wanting to be conscious for the sake of healing, for the sake of resolve, for the sake of letting go. And when our bodies are remembering, when our bodies are putting these pieces back together, um, it's powerful, but we're not often conscious of what's happening. We're not un often conscious that that is happening. So we're seeing what's happening. We're, we're watching what's happening in Israel, which we're watching what's happening in Gaza, in the West Bank, and our bodies are putting back together things that we recall from our own experiences. And this is painful. 
it's painful, it's shocking, um, it's devastating. There's enormous grief there, there's fear there, there's terror there. And I, and I really do believe that there's a, um, there's a divine design in this. Like this is uh, this, this rising up that's coming in inside of us is for the sake of healing is for the sake of liberation. And when this is rising up and we don't know, we're not conscious that this is, that this is historical, this is ancestral, then we might believe that what we're feeling is happening is a response to just right now. It's all about just right now. And this is another place for Dayenu, because when we forget that we're carrying these ancestral layers and we think that everything we're thinking and feeling in our bodies is a response to right now, then we allow the unconscious patterns to run. We allow the unconscious fear to run. And then we're part of decisions making, we're colluding with the decisions being made that aren't necessarily um, aligned with who we are, what we believe in this moment. Those decisions are aligned with what had happened before, the fear that's happened before, the terror that our bodies are carrying. So Dayenu, we get to like, we get to stop being led by the unconscious patterning. We get to honor it. We get to recognize it's there, but we don't get, we don't, we don't need to allow it to, to rule us, to run us, to be in charge of us. We actually get to um, have more agency than that. We have to choose to have more agency than that. And for me, um, I do that by um, being in a process of, of like sacred discernment, of really feeling for where the texture, the flavor is of those ancestral layers and really feeling for where the texture and the flavor is of my own embodied intuitive knowing right now. So this is where Rebecca's practice comes in, um, the slowing down. Especially for those of us, and I'm sure I'm not alone in this Zoom room circle right now, whose families move fast. This is just one of the many ways that, that the trauma plays out, but um, it doesn't feel very possible in my system to to know what is ancestrally inherited, what is the trauma that I'm holding, and what does my intuition tell me right now without slowing down? Um, so we're gonna go into into breakout rooms in a in a minute or two, and I I want to encourage you to think about what are some of those ways of of thinking and feeling and behaving that you can track through your family line that are really familiar to you and that you know are not necessarily aligned with this time. That are not necessarily, they're not necessary for your survival in this moment, but you do them anyway. Um, and I, and I, I wanna encourage you to think about these um, with like a lot of tenderness because this is one of the places where in, internalized anti-Semitism comes in and has us shaming ourselves for the patterns that we've inherited. And we don't need to do that to ourselves. We get to be really gentle there. We get to notice that, again, those, those, those behaviors were there for, for a reason when they were first when the, in the source moment. Um, but I want you to think about that. And I, I also just want to encourage people to think about what would happen if you slowed down in those moments. Like so, sometimes it almost feels like things might explode in my family, if we slowed down. Um, but I want you to think about what, what would happen if you did? Um, what would you be able to, where would you be able to find choice? What would you be able to notice and name and interrupt um, to give yourself more of an opportunity to be in alignment with how you think about and how you act in this moment?
I'll just say one more thing and then we'll go into breakout um, groups, which is that um, my, my intention, my kavana um, in moving into this season of liberation as Jews, um, while the while the, the violence in Gaza continues to unfold, is that we get to practice um, kind of hooking ourselves into clarity and connection rather than being driven by fear and survival. Okay. So um, we're going to go into, into small groups and um, please feel encouraged to, to do some deep dive in there. And then when we come back, um, I'm going to invite you to share in the chat little pieces that you're thinking about and going to keep thinking about so that we can be learning from each other's process. Okay, everyone, I'll see you in uh, a good 15 minutes. Sure, I've never talked about this in 20 minutes before, I usually like three hours, so. <laughs> Oof. And as a quick note, we had a couple people drop out. Um, so there is one room that has two people. I don't know if either of you want to fill that space or just let those two people be. Um, right, we have, we have um, two groups of three and one group. Oh no, three groups of three and one group of two. Um, let's, I'm going to, I'm going to, I feel like it's okay. Right. Okay. I mean, it's, I think it's important for me to stay here in case anybody comes super late and um, that feels okay to me. I think it's okay. I think we're okay. I mean, this is, I think in an ideal world we would have three, but it's okay. Um, you know, I, I, I'm I'm glad we're recording. We're gonna pause the recording. Do you want Amanda? Do... Hi. <laughs> Here we go. Okay. Welcome back, everyone. Really glad to see you. Back here, I I would love to. Well, first, let's just take a breath together. Let's go ahead, like Rebecca invited us, and let our exhales be extra long. Um, from what I've learned, when our when we let our exhale be longer than our inhale. Um we're activating the parasympathetic nervous system, the part of us that knows um, that we can rest, the part of us that can tell that we're safe, that can tell that we've arrived, so the, like the part of us that starts to digest and to integrate things. And so you have my permission for the rest of our time together tonight and for the rest of your lives to let your inhale, I mean, to let your exhale be nice and long, longer than your inhale just to gift that to the body. And I would love to see in the chat if folks are willing to share um, a nugget, an idea, a thought that they're, um, you're chewing on, that you wanna keep chewing on, and that we can kind of chew on with you if, you, if you're willing to share it. So. Um, if you want to take a minute, if you're willing to, what is, what is something you're thinking about that came up in your time or is coming up now, once we're back, that you're willing to tell us what's, what's alive for you?
I can offer something, Joe. This is such a beautiful set of questions to reflect on. Um, and in our group, we shared um, ancestral and personal sort of, some of them are dysfunctions now, but are we really able or ready to let them go? Like even to imagine it is challenging. Um, so we, we peeled away some layers there. Thank you, Laurie. So beautiful. Yeah. So it's it feels like a leap sometimes to let our bodies know that it's safe enough to try something else, right? It's safe enough to even consider doing it a different way. So thank you. Okay, let's see. We see Judy in the chat. Who would we be if we let them go? Would we still be Jews? Oof. Right. Thank you, Judy. Yeah, the way that our that sense of self and sense of identity and sense of history and also trauma gets all woven together. How do we how do we tease the pieces apart? Loss and change and creating new patterns, repatterning, repatterns. Beautiful. Right. And what if we aren't as safe as we think here in the US, right? Right. Right, so there's so much about um, like uh, feeling in 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 a, in a really deep way, feeling into what we actually want to be practicing in order to be um, cultivating that kind of safety, or noticing or building that kind of safety with our allies. Um, what kind of patterns that we have support us to do that? What kind of patterns do we have that are in the way of that? Um, and what kind of courage and connection do we need in order to discern what we want to keep practicing, how we want to orient, how we want to organize or reorganize ourselves? Beautiful. Um, so I, I want to just encourage folks to continue with these with these questions and um floating around oh and i can add it to the chat too is um the website transcending jewish trauma um there's a map on there that has um quite a wide array it's inconclusive but quite a wide array of different manifestations of some of this trauma um and i want to encourage you to check it out and notice what feels resonant um notice what you what is alive in your families, what is alive in your in your um, communities. Thank you, Amanda. Um, and again, I want to make sure that we are real gentle with ourselves and our people, our beloveds, when we're thinking about those patterns, because all of these patterns come from some time, some place when they were precisely attuned. Best practices. Um, so I want to encourage that. And I see that there's more thoughts coming through in the chat. Thank you. And I want to add one last piece before we kind of open it up to the Q&A, which is that um, I was just talking to Shira about this. What would happen in your Seder this year if you chose to slow down? <laughs> My first thought is like everything would everything would combust, like nothing would go well, you know, like we have to keep it up. But what if? What if you what if what if we slowed our bodies down as we entered into the the room where the Seder table was set? Exactly, Stefan, we'll find out. Yeah. Yeah. It feels like a radical act to even consider inviting more slowness, more of that parasympathetic pace, more of that kind of return to to ground in the body, so that we're um actually getting to experience the Seder towards liberation rather than just experiencing it and rehearsing the trauma. Okay, so with that, we're gonna open it up and- um, Ugh, wow. Hear what okay, I mean, I'm laughing about, I'm laughing also at the um, slow down um, because everybody's always like, you know, the main course is about to come out of the oven, like speed it up. You know, that's always the message in my family. Um, and uh, I'm laughing about that. I'm wondering, but, you know, we're 
lab shows, we are, you know, our origin story is storytelling. We are mythology. We, we live and work in the world of story. And it is wild that we, ha you know, that this story, like th that's why we're here. We're, sl we are, that's what the Seder for questions this is. And I want to invite Amichai to jump in here with me, please. And Amanda, please bring Amichai close, close by, because it's making me think like as storytellers and mythology weavers and like, and the way we value it so deeply, like what is up with this pattern of trying to get through the Haggadah story, the Magid section, specifically the story is so quickly. Um, there's just so much here, but um, I, if, it, if it's okay, like there's just one other question I kind of want to bring in and it's a little bit of a mix of a few things I'm seeing in the chat. And then, which is like when Beth wrote, there is the challenge of addressing these traumas and then beyond the healing, what are the gifts that have come to us as a result? And this is one of the questions I kind of something similar, Beth, that I was asking Joe earlier when I remembered that she, what you said, Joe, about um, that we carry an imprint. We're carrying the imprint. And I was thinking like literally the imprint is the Seder table. Like we have designed it as such. And we make it the same every year and we have this, and it's, we've beautified it. And it's a gift because it's an imprint. And it's also, as you said, these layers and layers of thinking and being that we carry in our blood and in our fat cells that want to be known so that we can heal and we can resolve. And it's like, in, in the way we prepare our seders tonight, can we speak a little bit about that? Um, where do these two meet? Almost, I almost want to ask that. Yeah. I mean, one thought that I have is this is not addressing the Seder itself, but I, I have found um, that the more of the trauma that becomes conscious and the more of those layers that we get to release, um, the more like true self comes in. And that true self to me also carries the gifts, also carries the inherited gifts, but without the wounding. Um, and I think that sometimes I don't, I have a lot of people that I've worked with who feel like the only thing they've gotten from their ancestors is pain. And I understand why people feel that way is because so much of the gifts are cloaked in the pain. And then people are afraid, well, if I let the pain go, then I'm letting my ancestors go. Then I have no connection. And I think that this is a, um, it's like a, it's a confusion that we have when we're not in a culture that talks a lot about or practices the, the, the teasing apart of the pain from the gifts. And what I've, what I've seen and what I've experienced myself is when more and more of those layers of pain are conscious and we're releasing, then the gifts are like, it's, it's kind of impossible to see them and to feel them and to be in, in the embodiment of them. Um, there's a readiness for the trauma to be released and there's a readiness for the gifts to be embodied. Those come together. Um, and I, I don't want us to be afraid to let go of the pain um, because we're afraid that we then won't have the connection. I don't, I don't believe that that's true. Um, so, okay, so then in thinking about the Seder, I'm curious what it would be like to tell, like to, to do the Magid, to do the telling from a place of recognizing that as we tell it, it's like, it's as if we're um, someone's, it's like someone's reading our diary. Like we are carrying the imprint of that story in ourselves and what happens and more of more of it is like resonates and actually, actually we can feel it and it actually releases from us. Um, what more of like the magic inside of those stories becomes revealed. Hmm which I think requires slowing down back to my main push here. Yeah. 
Yes. You know, what's so ironic about the slowing down part that I totally agree. And like I said before, this whole hundreds of years old fallacy since printing, right? This is this is a printing fallout that every household has a Haggadah and without knowing how to uh, equip people and train people to be the home priests of their seders and like, skip this, read this. Like it's, it's an instructional tutorial that free Zoom back in the 16th. 17th, 18th, 19th, 20th, like it never happened. Like you either handed it over from generation to generation or you didn't. So somehow it became this thing that you read the whole thing, which really is like a terrible thing. Never meant to be. But we're stuck with it. So, no, in my family, there's a thing called um, Zimmerman. Zimmerman is like, you, you don't really pronounce the words. It's like, it's called Zimmerman. I don't know why. <laughs> but you read the whole thing super fast. Now, the irony is that the original, one of the original tropes of the story in the, in, in the book of Exodus is that on that night, oh, yeah. right. we left in a rush. We oh. were running. We were literally running. It's like midnight, boom. We better run before they change their minds. So part of the traumatic... Right somatic memory of this story that I don't think ever happened, but the way our ancestors have been telling it for so long is that we are on the run. This thing happens fast. You eat the thing, you think it's like, it is a mimetic quickness, right. quickness thing. So there is a sense of trauma, stress, fast running that's actually built into the ritual theater. But we've lost it so long ago that all there is is just the stress minus the knowledge of why. And part of the Dayenu that I'm thinking of this year, I doubt it's going to happen at the first Seder that I'm co-hosting. And I'm, and I don't know about the second one either, but like people don't want to give up all those bricks of bondage. No, that's how we do it. And I'm like, no, just don't, just stop. Let's just not read any of it. Let's just be like Quakers. Let's just sit. And wait, it's not going to happen. So between the ideal and the real, I'm sitting here and thinking, how do we bring Dayenu into a real practical Passover baby steps of recognizing that we're carrying all this trauma <clears throat> and that despite our wishes, many of us were going to be gathering at these seders, Jewish, Jewish, jew Jacent politically this way, politically that way, don't want to talk about it, only want to talk about it. I'm like, mm, this is not the night to deal with trauma. Let's just get this all, like over with. And some of us are like, are you kidding? What are we here to do? <laughs> so it's like, it's really, we're, we're asking a lot of ourselves, is all I'm saying. It might not happen one night or two. Um. We are asking a lot of ourselves. This is classic. This is a classic lab show conundrum as far as I'm concerned. I mean, when these questions kind of birthed, the, you know, in, you know, when they started, we started asking them, um, it was like a, you know, breath came and they're really hard. I mean, every single one of them is so hard and it's just such an enormous, it's like we're deconstructing, but we're really opening up a chasm. Um, I see that Khani is with a raised hand. I would love to hear um, from you, Khani. Come in, what, what you got? I'm wondering a lot about the end as opposed to the either or, the both end, you know, um, Thank you. I think Beth thanked me for the for the for the trauma gift that we get because all of our ancestors' traumas also carry within them gifts. Always, it's always like the noticing. And so, what would it be like? What would it look like? Even if we were at a seder that maybe someone else led or someone else wanted us to do quickly, right? Or whatever it is, right? Shira, you're doing this. Like, made me raise my hand because I'm always thinking of like. Food's coming out, food's coming out, right? Like that <laughs> that has to be at a certain time. And what I've lately been doing at the Seder has been, we'll get to what we get to. 
the time comes and we pause and we stop and we eat. And there is a way in storytelling where the story will take us if we pause long enough, if we don't wanna tell the whole story. I'm not coming in here to tell you the whole story. I'm here to tell you the story. Let's see how yeah. we go, how the story takes us as opposed to like, there's this story I have to tell. And when I have to tell the story, I'm trying to cram in a story in a very short amount of time. But when I'm just here to tell the story and we're e all here to hear and tell the story, the story takes a life on, on its own and it does close itself. We don't have to be the one closing it. It happens organically. And so in that moment of the both end of like, yes, let's show up, let's tell the story. And we don't have to finish it. We just have to be the storyteller. I don't know if that makes a whole lot of sense, but it's like, it's that invitation of walking into the storytelling and not having to finish that allows the spaciousness for all the ways everybody else wants it to done. And then whatever time we're going to eat, we're going to eat. Yeah. And the story has been told because we've all been moved by it. Mm -hmm. So. Thank you. Mm -hmm. welcome. Thank you for this. Yeah. Honey, I feel like you're um you're speaking to like the the loosening up and the letting go of that rigidity that so many of us have inherited of like this is the way this is this must be the way and like inviting in so much more agency and choice mm -hmm. to actually feel for what we're meant to receive in this moment rather than kind of plowing through for the sake of having gotten it done it does it feels like a like an uncloaking um, of those rigid layers. It, yeah, it also makes me re remember that the story is a being unto itself. Like the story is, the story is here before us, after us. Like it's a, it's, it's, it's a great point though. Like how do we interact with the story? And I'm seeing another major symbol in the chat, which is coming up, which is the matzah. And, and of course, I mean, Amichai, it's just so true. It's like, there's that whole point. I just did a children's concert and we like, really, we're like, we, we run, we, it's run. You're right. Oh my God, just telling the story again and again, but the matzah, you know, and I see a few of us are saying, yes, the reason for the matzah is fastness. And the reason for the matzah is there are many reasons for the matzah, but it's true that like the classic, like part of the narrative is like, you make the bread, doesn't have time to rise. So it's flat. But we're thinking a lot about the matzah right now, and I'm maybe there is a place in the day for in the matzah um, for Dayenu work. Um, actually, and I'm, I don't know. What do you all think about that? I mean, I'm I, I know that we're in, pre in preparation for Sabbath clean this Friday, everyone tomorrow. Um, uh, Joe, that's our monthly um, Sabbath gathering. Uh, we will, you know, we will we will do some um spirit we will deal with some spiritual chamet some some like the opposite of matzah and we'll be thinking of matzah both as like about about um you know amichai uses the words soured like what is sour like the chametz the chametz of the souredness like what has what do you look through your cabinets and what is like you can let go of now. That's part of the dainu conversation and i i like to think of it as like just what is like what are your essentials what is you bring with you what is essential on this journey and it's like there seems like there could be some dainu work in there i don't know um what do you think about that joe it's like, even in our time right now i'm speaking in shorthand but <laughs> i'll throw it your way um, yeah um well first of all it's such a beautiful um it's such a beautiful opportunity to like take some of these ideas about ancestral inheritance and trauma and gifts and put them right into the Seder. I feel like the Seder is like, like the Seder itself is like, yes, this is what I've been trying to get you to talk about. This is what we're here for. <laughs> so I feel the ripeness of it. Yeah. Um, and I feel like the one of the pieces you're talking about, Shira, is, is about the discernment of like, what is, um, what in this moment can I, can I feel is kind of holding me back from like a full expression or a full freedom or a full liberation or fully connected mm. what are those things like what is that hummus that's like keeping me tethered um to what is what has come before that doesn't allow me to also move move into the you know across the sea mm -hmm. um and i don't think that it's i think there's something powerful about getting to 
to decide what what that is this year um like what are those what are those things that you can let go of this year in particular um that will allow that kind of agency to to come in and capacity to come in and connection to come in I remind us all here on this call that we are all ritualists. That we're all going to have some wild ass dreams tonight too. So take notes. Um, there may be some really interesting new ritual that is born of this conversation. Um, I really appreciate it. I see, um, I see one other question. I think we have time for that. Amichai, I want to make sure that you have, you know, I don't want, I wonder if you, if you're thinking about anything. Um, I'd love to hear Kati's question and then go through the actual guide with folks to go yeah. look at the third question in context of what we were doing today. So as you think about your seders, where would you integrate potentially this third, this Dayenu question and, and, and hold it on to an actual moment. Fantastic. But um, yeah, Kati would be great to hear what you have to say. Yes. Oh yeah, hi. Um, so, so I think I'm in, in a different place from many other people because I haven't had many seders in my life. <laughs> I didn't grow up with it, so it's not for me. It's not like, oh, let's get over this already. You know, I know the story or whatever. And when, um, when our son was was fairly young, we once organized a seder, but I. You know, as I said, I didn't really grow up with it, so I was not, you know, really confident of what to do. So basically, we just read the whole Exodus, and and he was a young person, and but he was so wide eyed, and and he said it was the best day of his life, and it was just so on, and it took hours and hours reading the story, and it was great, and and that's my template for, you know, what a real seder should be like, and and since then I've been at, you know, some in-laws and relatives, and, and everybody's, you know, let's just get to the food and whatnot, and I'm thinking, well, that's not it, you know, we really have to read the whole thing, you know, we have to, we have to hear the story, but but I, I understand, you know, it makes sense if, if you had have had dozens of it already, you know, maybe that's too much to do the whole thing. So, but I'm just not sure, you know, where where I will come down on it this time. Wow. Well, Kati, you got a couple of weeks, and I think the main question is who's in the room? Right? Who's gonna be in the room? What do you want to achieve? What's doable? What's not doable? It's different if there's kids. It's different if it's your first or hundredth seder. Um, mm -hmm. Like everything, like every dinner party, like every ritual, like every conversation, being very thoughtful ahead of time. What's going to potentially work and what's not. And that's true for every year. And that's true for every Passover. And we feel that this year there's extra sensitivity because a lot of us are carrying a lot of pain a lot of us are asking a lot of questions not just four and we want to make sure that when we come to these seder nights aware of all the generational old traumas that we're carrying as jews as humans as people of different legacies and nationalities and pain points um we um, we maybe not lean into a big psychodrama, but we don't hurt either. Like there's a way where we 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 are able to hold and not hurt. So you gotta do your homework, and I don't know. Reading the whole Exodus sounds insane, but uh, I'm glad you did it. <laughs> Hashtag never again. I don't know. Maybe yeah. a lot of people do a lot of different things. Um, but thank you. Thank you. So, yeah. so what I want to do in the, in the few minutes we have left folks, Amanda, if you don't mind sharing the, um, the full guide that y'all, and we'll put the PDF link in the chat for y'all to get it from our website. And, um, 
to ground ourselves in tonight's conversation, thinking exactly as Kathy just demonstrated, how do I bring this to the Seder? Right? So here's our first question, which is we, we recommend at the beginning of Seder, and then the second one, which is Avadim Hainu, maybe that's the Magid section. Like, how do we retell, as Khani said, which part of the story are we going to tell this year? Maybe not the whole thing. And then finally, we get, oh, next we're getting to Dayenu. So here's just let's go over what's on 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 the in this guide. How do we say enough already to stop the tragic cycle of oppression and violence as we commit to repair? What are some hopeful narratives, voices, and choices that can help us chart a better path at this time? Host note: This third round, usually after the main meal, so everyone's relaxed, you've had your brisket or vegetarian choice, and with a third cup. We can talk about personal or societal responses to what enslaves and hold us back from our collective equity and justice. Probably a good idea to combine this with the singing of Dayenu, whatever version, because people love that. Um, and then here we wrote, well, the Hafi Komen I'm not going to talk about tonight. But going back to what we just talked about, I'm thinking not about the matzah, but about marol. There is a Jewish gastro traumatic experience of eating bitter herbs. You can do the lettuce thing. No one's going to judge you. But honestly, it is a spoon full of horseradish to take the medicine down. And I grew up in a sadomasochistic Seder where you ate the whole thing until you had tears. That's trauma. That's internalizing, perpetuating. And so what if you did a, a, a moral moment and of, of eating this bitter thing and saying, what like what bitterness are we recycling? What if I got to say no to some of this bitterness? What don't I want to hand over to the next generation? The sense of running, the sense of rush, the sense of othering, the sense of scapegoating, the sense of carrying this angst in my body of being enslaved. There's gifts in it, but what if there's a Dayenu conversation here? So maybe when you're eating the mo, maybe at the third cup, maybe when you're singing Dayenu and everyone's had food already and enough wine. So however it is, we're, we're going to end in just a moment. We, we really want to invite you to, even not at Seder, ahead of Seder, do our own homework. What are we ready to let go of? Yes. So let's go back. Um, Amanda, you can unshare the handout. It is yours to have. And sure, I'm going to let you help us close. Well, I just, yeah, you know, yeah, don't go anywhere, Amichai, because I want you to tell us about next week. It's our fourth session next week. Um, so beautifully crafted. And wow, Joe, Kent, Katz, um, Rebecca had to go, uh, I know, earlier, but um, thank you. <laughs> thank you is such a simple way to say what is really a big breath, uh, a big breath. Thank you. Um, this is just really a game changer and I need it to be. And Amichai, when you, again, I, I say, I, you, you asked these questions and you, and you said, we, we got to keep changing the game and you did. And so thank you, Amichai also. Um, thank you, Amanda, for holding our space. So, so with such care and detail. And I really appreciate all of you for being here in this practice and for all of you watching afterwards. Um, we can't wait to hear what you're thinking about. And please, you know, share, share what's on your ritual imagination and um, we want to hear more about it. We have a, a number of upcoming events coming tomorrow is our Sabbath Queen dedicated to the eclipse and the cycles and the seasons and the spirals. And as in the words of Joe Kent Katz, the divine design, that is so real. So I'm, I'm very honored to be uh, in circles again with you tomorrow. There is more Passover things listed in the, in the chat. It's all on our website. Um, and next week will be our closing session, but not even remotely closing. Tell us about it, Amichai. So, friends, next year is our fourth and last question. Lashana Haba'a next year in maybe Jerusalem, maybe the Bronx, but mostly what will next year look like as a vision of better? If we were to really put our futurist minds towards the visions we crave, 
So we have a few futurists with us next week, and we're all going to co-create these visions together. Those include uh, Libby Lenkinski and Mushon, who is one of the founders of uh, Eretz Lekulam, A Land for All, an Israeli-Palestinian project that's really imagining the future of both people living together. Um, and Libby, who was the vice president of the New Israel Fund and a beloved lab schuler. And David Broza is going to come in with a cameo of singing some future ballads for the future we all want. So start thinking about the visions you want to put on the table next week and next year. And that's going to be our fourth and final one for now. So, Shira, thank you for being an awesome co-pilot. Thank you all for being with us tonight. Dayeno, enough is enough. Yeah. Get some sleep. We'll see you tomorrow night or very soon. Thank you so much. <laughs>